As you know, airport security has uh, tightened up quite a bit. And uh, there was uh, one individual who uh, <coughs> came up to the uh, boarding gate to get on the plane, and you could see they were in trouble. They were doing one of these, you know? And they couldn't find their boarding pass. And so out comes a credit card receipt. Well, I, I've got the receipt right here for the ticket. Ah, the receipt won't do. When looking through, oh, well, here's my luggage tags. Oh, no, the lug luggage tags won't do. So they open up their briefcase and they look through and they've got a printed out itinerary and they show the itinerary. No, the itinerary won't do. They had brochures for the convention where they were traveling to. Hotel reservations, the whole thing. But can't find that boarding pass. Without that boarding pass, they weren't going to get on that plane. And uh, all of the other documentation or information that they had was uh, of no value without that boarding pass. That boarding pass was the key or the required document to be able to get on that plane. You see, it didn't matter how much extra stuff they had. It was what they didn't have that mattered. Uh, so it is, I think, when we talk about going to heaven. Uh, when we talk about uh, entrance to heaven, so often people have all kinds of extra stuff attached to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what is important is not what is the extra stuff, but do they have the vital things? That is a knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that it is by faith that they receive that grace. If you'd open up your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 18, we're going to look today at the foundation or the beginning of the church at Ephesus. And the first uh, few groups of people that we're going to be introduced to had lots of information, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, even uh, excellent debaters about the things of God, but they were missing some vital information. They were missing that boarding pass of the full knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that needed to be imparted to them. In Acts chapter 18, beginning at verse 23. It says, And having spent some time there, Paul left and passed successively through the Galatian region, through Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. This was his third missionary journey. And so he's taking a quick sweep back through the cities that he'd established and the places where he had had an opportunity to evangelize people. And in verse 24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Now this was a very knowledgeable man, probably a very wealthy man, and uh, a, a, a man who could uh, speak and share from the mighty scriptures. But in verse 25, it says, This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Now, here was a man who knew a lot about Jesus, uh, about his ministry, uh, who could debate from the Old Testament about uh, maybe the messiahship of Jesus, the passages that he thought fit with the life of Jesus, and yet he only knew about the baptism of John the Baptist. Apparently, he didn't know about the baptism of the Spirit of God, which comes 
from a trusting in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He knew about Jesus' life, but apparently he didn't know about his death, burial, resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 26 it says, But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, Priscilla and Aquila, the friends of Paul, friends who had been kicked out of uh, Jerusalem, kicked out of Rome, who had uh, worked with Paul side by side in uh, probably making of uh, tent sales and tents and things like that. Priscilla and Aquila heard him and they pulled him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he had went to go across to Acacia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples there. Here was a man who had a tremendous amount of knowledge about Jesus and the Old Testament, but it wasn't quite complete. And so Aquila and Priscilla pull him aside and teach him about the grace of God, about the life of Christ more accurately. Sometimes when we get into discussions with people or debates with people, a lot of the debate or a lot of the discussion is about extra things. And, uh, and I don't know who's going to be in heaven and who's not going to be in heaven. Uh, someone has said that the greatest surprise will not be who's there, but who's not there at times. But people have all kinds of extra baggage sometimes. But the most important thing that we want to discern when we talk to somebody about Jesus Christ is do they accurately understand this, that Jesus died for their sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that by grace we can be saved through trust, not just intellectual knowledge, but trust in Jesus Christ. Apollos was knowledgeable, he was eloquent, and he could debate, but there was the some gap between the baptism of John, the death, burial, resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, that he needed to complete that to be a believer in Jesus Christ, to have that passport to enter into heaven. Well, Aquila and Priscilla have this uh, wonderful opportunity to pull him aside. And then along comes the Apostle Paul in chapter 19. And the Apostle Paul came to Ephesus and he found some disciples there. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said... Into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. In other words, in the name of John. But, Jesus, uh, but Paul said, John's, uh, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apparently, these are some disciples of John the Baptist who uh, identified with John, identified with the desire of the coming of the Messiah, and then they went off into ministry. And they went off traveling about, preaching this good news of prepare ye the way of the Lord, the Messiah is coming, and be baptized in preparation for that, for the repentance of your sins. And they were so out of the loop <laughs> that they didn't even know everything that had taken place. Hey, guys, let me tell you, Fantastic things have happened. Jesus died. That's good news? Oh, yeah, he rose. And that there's a baptism now that a person can have, not just the washing of the water, 
but the washing of the Spirit of God, a baptism in which the Spirit of God comes to dwell within you for eternity. And it says in verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men, another group of disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we might ask ourselves, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, why do we see this speaking in tongues, and why do we see this prophesying? There are those today in Christianity, I believe that they are Christians, I believe that they understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but they have some extra baggage that they throw in along with it that if you're truly saved, you will speak in tongues. If you are truly saved, you will prophesy. And they take this uh, transitional book of Acts, which is a transition from uh, meeting in synagogues to meeting in homes and churches, from believing in the Old Testament only to having a New Testament, from uh, looking for the Messiah to looking back to the Messiah, from a, a Jewish community to a Jew, Gentile, and the whole world community. And in this transition, when the Spirit of God is impacting different communities, they want to take that and they want to make it normative, that this is the way it happens to all people, when in the book of Acts, it didn't even happen normatively or regularly to other people in that day. Paul even says, do all speak in tongues? No. Do all prophesy? No. But in this situation, it was necessary for the Spirit of God to demonstrate his power in the lives of these disciples, as we're going to see the Holy Spirit demonstrating his power in the life of Paul through miracles to validate his ministry. Remember in Acts chapter 15, when the Jerusalem council came together and they asked themselves this question, does a Gentile have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? Must a Gentile go through circumcision? Must a Gentile keep the law? Must a Gentile be a proselyte underneath our jurisdiction in order to become a Christian. And both Paul and Peter, they stand up and they say, let me tell you how the Spirit of God came upon the Jews, how the Spirit of God came upon the Gentiles, how the Spirit of God demonstrated his presence in the life of people miraculously. And both Peter and Paul said the Gentiles and the Jews received the Spirit in the same way and they evidenced the indwelling of the Spirit in the same manner. And therefore, a Jew, a Gentile, does not have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. You know, there are people today who think that a Gentile has to become a Baptist to become a Christian. And, of course, the Presbyterians know that's wrong because a Gentile has to become a Presbyterian to become a Christian. I was recently on a, a little outing with a man who was brought up in uh, the Netherlands denomination. And they were firmly taught and they firmly believe that a person has to become a Netherland to become a Christian. And only true Christians are Netherlands. And only Netherlands are true Christians. There's all kinds of extra stuff at times. The thing that we want to focus first and foremost on is do people understand the grace gospel? Verse 7 and verse 8. He entered the synagogue. He continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. For three months, Paul was debating them. But when some were becoming hardened... Now, this is what happens when you proclaim the gospel... People either get hard or they get soft, but nobody stays the same. There's no room 
or opportunity for neutrality. They either soften up and you see the Spirit of God working in their heart and bringing them, or they harden and harden and harden. And when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking then evil of the way, because if you're going to get hard and you're not going to accept, you have to go on the attack. And notice, this is the Apostle Paul doing the preaching. You know, sometimes we, we get all bent out of shape with false guilt. We say, oh, if I only would have said this, or if I would have said it this, this way, or if I only would have done this a little different, so on and so forth, you know. And we seem to blame ourselves when a person doesn't respond to the gospel. Hey, the Apostle Paul didn't hit a home run every time. He didn't get a convert every time. But they began speaking evil of the way, which was one of the terms for early Christianity because early Christianity didn't have the ways, plural. They had the way. Jesus said, I'm the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is salvation in no other, for there's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby ye must be saved, the name of Jesus. That is unique to Christianity, is that Christianity believes that God is the one who determines the way. And the way is his son, Jesus Christ. And so they were speaking evil of the way before the people. He withdrew, Paul says he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. You know, the Apostle Paul wasn't going to fight him. He'd debate, he'd discuss, but when it became hardened, when it became embittered, when it became a conflict, then he chose to pull back and to leave it with the Lord. We don't have to argue with people in an argumentative way. We can contend for the faith without being contentious. We need to share, but when that kind of attack and when that kind of uh, resistance comes, it's time to just leave it alone and pray. Verse 10, this took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. Boy, wouldn't that be nice to have in pastoral ministry? You sick? Come by and get a hanky. You really sick? I'll give you my apron for the day. But you know... The people who want to claim often tongues and prophecy and so on and so forth, you know, they, they don't seem to be able to claim these other kinds of miracles. We're talking about extraordinary miracles for extraordinary times, unique miracles to validate, Acts tells us, the ministry of the Spirit of God in the lives of people. Verse 13, but also some of the Jewish exorcists. There were uh, Jewish exorcists in that day that would cast out demons. Exorcism is uh, part of uh, spiritual warfare and, and spiritual uh, 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 dynamics. And uh, there were exorcists in that day that were Jewish, and they would cast out uh, demons and uh, wicked angels. It says there were Jewish exorcists who went from place to place and attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you or I command you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief high priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you and the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped out and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded this became known to all 
both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them and upon all of them in the name of the Lord Jesus, who was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, so that the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Here were these uh, Jewish exorcists who were trying to capitalize probably both in uh, stature and financially on the name of Jesus. <laughs> and yet they didn't know Jesus. And the result was that they entered into a domain of warfare that uh, no one should go without much prayer and certainly without knowing Jesus. And they suffered the consequences of it all. But as the word of the Lord began to spread into the community and into the hearts and lives of people, now we're talking about believers here, people who had believed then had to go through the process of discarding those things that had a very detrimental or sinful impact upon their life. You know, when they got saved... <laughs> They didn't all of a sudden overcome all of their sins, did they? They didn't all of a sudden uh, uh, have all of the uh, strength of Christian living. They had to continue to grow and to grow through this process. And they had to dump that magic. And they had to dump those books. And, you know, this is a whole lot of money in this bonfire. I mean, why didn't they just turn around and sell them? and at least get the money out of it <laughs> because they understood that they would be passing on only wickedness. Many of those who believed kept coming, confessing, disclosing their practices and turning away from their sins. That is a lifelong process for us as believers in Jesus Christ, isn't it? But you need to make some decisive decisions if you are tolerating, if you are engaging in, if you are practicing those things of the former way of life, of the way of the flesh, what Paul would call the lusts of the mind and of the body, if you are harboring those, if you are keeping those, then those are things that need to be discarded and destroyed. Over the years, I've worked with people who uh, inadvertently uh, got involved in the occult or in magic. Sometimes you think it's innocent. Sometimes you think it's playful. I'm not talking about the Hollywood stage stuff, which is sleight of hand. I'm talking about the black magic of the occult, the witchcraft of it all, the Ouija boards, the tarot cards and other things. And they got involved in that, or they got involved with people and the people would give them gifts, and, and somehow those gifts had attached to them a spirit of wickedness. And those things had to be taken out and destroyed. Beloved, we, we are involved in spiritual warfare. The wickedness of this world is beyond just human explanation. And much of it has to do with the evil spirits called demons and fallen angels. And if uh, you are holding on to any kind of literature or sources or things that pull you into sin, you need to discard them. You need to destroy them. Over the years, I have worked occasionally with uh, young men and young women who got involved in witchcraft and in the occult. And they had uh, everything from books to magazines to audio tapes to so on and so forth. And uh, often it's involved also with pornography. And they had to take those things out and they had to have a bonfire for the glory of God. So these were being set free. Go on down to verse uh, 21. Now, after these things were finished, Paul 
purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed from Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way or Christianity. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, who uh, was bringing no small or no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades. He got all the unions together. He said, man, you know that our prosperity depends upon our business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, they're not only concerned about business falling off, they're concerned about their reputation falling off. We would fall into uh, disrepute, but we're going to start losing business. We're going to start seeing our bottom line go down. Verse 28, when they had heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion. They rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Now, again, we need to appreciate the significance of this business for these people. I mean, this is like uh, saying uh, that the big three are going to leave Detroit and we're going to lose all of these jobs. The temple of Artemis, or the Romans called this uh, goddess Diana, uh, the temple was the center place of the city. Ephesus was a very wealthy city. It was a seaport city. It was the, the last stop for all of the goods coming overland to go out to sea or for all of the goods coming in imported to go out to the rest of the world. And in the city, they had this temple. It was about the size of a small football stadium. Probably not as big as Ford Field, but a whole lot nicer. Columns uh, 60 and 100 feet tall. Uh, circulating the entire building with all kinds of rooms. And, of course, it was the center of sinful attraction. And so they rush into the theater, and they want to uh, persecute those who are turning people away from the idolatry. Verse 30, And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him, and so some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him, repeatedly urged him not to go into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. The majority did not know for what reason they had come to gather. But for two hours they would stand up and they would scream and they would shout, Great is Artemis, the god of Ephesus. Well, eventually, the city clerk prevails, and he's able to quiet the town, and he says to them, look, we are in breach of Roman law here, for there is no good reason for us to have this assembly or to have this riot. If these men have violated a law, then let them be taken to court. But if not, then we may be in trouble with Rome, so let's go to our homes and deal with this properly. That was the founding of the church at Ephesus. And there the Apostle Paul, in the midst of uh, all of this um, spiritual warfare and conflict, he spent considerable time teaching and discipling these people that when you turn to God, you turn to a life in which there is a process for the rest of your life where you will constantly be turning away from the things of the world and you will be dumping out of your life 
the things of the past. It's a, it's a life of grace. It's a life that the more you understand the forgiveness of God, the more you fall in love with him. Now, as we enter into this uh, book of Ephesians, and I've included an overview synthetic chart for you, one of the major emphases of the Apostle Paul is that Jews and Gentiles are united in one body with Christ, the head of the church. And what he's going to try to communicate to them is that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're a slave or whether you're a master, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you are one family in Jesus Christ. Today we might say whether you're an Israeli or a Palestinian, whether you're an African American, an Irish American, an Italian American, or a plain old vanilla European American. In the body of Christ, you are one. That prejudice has no place in the body of Christ because we have all been brought there by grace. And it is by grace that the conflicts and the disharmony are done away with because in the communion table, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has brought us together as one, as one family. You might remember me telling you the story when we were living in Jerusalem that we had invited over some Jewish people that we had met that were Christians. And at the same time, we had invite, invited over some Palestinian friends that we had met that were Christians. As I, enter, as I uh, had these uh, uh, men arrive and I introduced them, I introduced them by their name. Uh, this is Ariel, and this is uh, Mohammed. Uh, Ariel is a... Uh, Jewish Christian, Israeli citizen, and uh, Mohammed is a, a Palestinian uh, citizen and a Christian, and the two of them looked at each other like, how can this be? I mean, the, the weirdest expression came over their face, and I remember the Palestinian saying, this man Mohammed saying, I didn't know that there were any Jewish Christians. Christians who are Israelis. Are, are you sure? <laughs> and there in that tiny little apartment, we had the sweetest fellowship. We had the most wonderful beginning of friendship. We had a time of prayer because the peacemaker, Jesus Christ, was a part of of the communion. That's in part what the book of Ephesians is about. What is it necessary to have to be a citizen of heaven? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, you got extra baggage, maybe you've got some confusion, and you think there's other needs, but the bottom line is this. <coughs> Jesus Christ his grace by faith unites us together. Let's pray.